Hello, everybody. Um, again, I'm actually replacing Emily Braithwaite. I'm, unfortunately, she wasn't able to make it, so I'm presenting on broadleaf weed control on golf course fairways. I am Emily's uh, co-worker at Oregon State University. I'm actually a postdoc there, um, but I'm actually going to start at the United States Department of Agriculture August 1st as a weed scientist. So this is somewhat germane to what I'll be working on in the future, but mainly in grass seed production is what I'll be working on. So when I was a former golf course superintendent, and whenever I think about broadleaf weed management, um, I always think about where I had the most trouble managing weeds. And to be frank, the fairways was not the hardest part for me. The hardest part for me was around the bunker faces, out in the rough, the areas where I wasn't able to have dense turf. And so we do a lot of talk, a lot of speaking events in Oregon about people who don't want to use herbicides in their lawns for um, X reasons, and so what we always talk about is turf grass density. And I am not going to try to spend too much time talking about turf grass density, although that is the answer. The answer is to make your turf dense to avoid voids in the system. If there's a void, if there's a space in your system, the weed seed bank is so prolific, as soon as you get light and water, you're going to get seeds to germinate in that area. Every turf grass scientist will tell you density is key. And so what we're really talking about is ecology. We're talking about the juxtaposition of weed ecology and grass ecology. And our job as turf grass managers is to try to make that ecology swing, that balance in favor of turf. And so density is what we're trying to do. Density is our best defense. Fairway density is about growing grass. And so what we typically want to do is we typically want to mow at the adequate mowing height, we want to fertilize sufficiently, and we want to be able to enable the grass to have enough irrigation that it's not going to thin out, it's not going to get under drought stress. The last time I came to a conference in Europe was in Manchester. And I was, as I was perambulating out into the English countryside, um, next to the Sports, Traf Sports Turfgrass Research Institute, I ran across this golf course that only irrigated their greens. Now, it is really difficult to maintain turfgrass density in a drought setting where we have multiple opportunities to weaken the stand, to weaken our turf grass density. So anywhere that these golfers are making divots, where they're you know, doing golf shoe damage, et cetera, et cetera, these are ample opportunities for those weed seeds in that seed bank to germinate and to take over. I also was formerly a golf course superintendent in Paris, and knowing the European environment, which we're standing in Denmark right now, there's a very high likelihood you will have no fungicides available in the future. This was our problem in Paris, was microdochium patch. If you didn't spray your turf grass sites, specifically if they were annual bluegrass dominated, you were weakening your stand all winter, and all these weed seeds would germinate in the spring. So we have golf, course, golf courses that are on low maintenance budgets in Oregon. This is my friend, Will Benson. Many of you may know him from Twitter. He's in Eugene, Oregon, just about 45 minutes south of us. He actually does a lot of overseeding with bent grass into his fairways. We have adequate irrigation. He's able to maintain turf grass density. Whenever he sees a void in the system, he puts seed down. He also has the advantage of annual bluegrass consistently provi providing seed by itself. So he's able to get that involved. However, in some of the damper areas or perhaps in the shade, his fairways do have some weed problems. There's actually some, e some English daisy um, kind of getting in there. The growing point of the plant is below a half of an inch. We often see plantains, dandelions, and English daisy, and of course clover that are in, in getting into our fairway systems. But all is not lost. The future is bright for new technologies. We have multiple turf grass scientists in the United States working on ways of doing weed recognition using camera technology. This is really close to coming onto the market. In fact, John Deere released a commercial product just this, this year where you can buy a sprayer that automatically has cameras on each nozzle. And as it grows across a field, so while the field is fallow, it can recognize a green plant and only turn on the nozzle that's directly above the weed every time. And you can reduce your herbicide use by, you know, x-fold. Like, so it can be really a positive thing for the future. And so this is something that we should be seeing coming forward. We also have 
And, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but when I was an undergrad at Purdue University, we used to walk golf courses with our advisors. And sometimes my advisor at the time was Zach Riker and Clark Throssell, you may know the names. They would, we would often be in this area and it would just be completely covered in weeds and Clark and Zach would be like, okay, what would you do? And everybody was talking about their herbicide program and they were like, perennial ryegrass germinates in three days. Just kill it all and throw down some seed because it's going to be a whole lot quicker to get a really nice stand of grass in this problem area than it is to have to spray it out with 2,4-D, wait for all these broadleaf weeds to die away, and then put seed down. Like, there's, there's something to be said about the beauty of perennial ryegrass germinating um, within, a, you know, less than a week when the temperatures are nice and conducive. And so we have alternative ways of killing weeds without chemicals. So this is an example of a steamer. Um, there's actually steamers that go on back of tractors. Um, this here is actually looks like something you'd see on an electrical grid. It's actually PTO driven on the back of a tractor and it'll actually electrocute the weeds. I have some close-up photos here in a second. And there's new technology now, and I believe we'll see this tomorrow, uh, at least on one of the tours, if not all of them. There's actually laser weeders now that are using camera technology in agriculture, and they can actually go in between and just pinpoint spray um, or spin Pin, pin, well, very tightly apply a laser beam and uh, burn, and you can actually see the burns here, and this is actually a Seattle company startup. The machine is slow, it's bulky, it has to process data uh, quickly, um, but it, this, is, this is coming on the market and there's no reason to believe that that would be restricted moving forward. So weed ecology, it's about density. So uh, this is not a new problem. So the United States Golf Association, um, 1930, question and answers. Somebody asked, how do I get re ridding weeds of fairways, um, of dandelions in the fairways? And the USGA responds, fairways are improved by fertilizing. Grass by feeding is able to compete more successfully. Density is key. You have to favor the, the desired crop in this setting. And so some things, uh, so John just was mentioning about um, the chelated iron. We've done a lot of iron work. Um, that's great, great information. So this is actually another study that Aaron Hathaway, who's a new farmer, he's actually presenting on a couple of topics here at this conference. He was previously a faculty member at Michigan State. And we do it, like, again, we do a lot of talks in Oregon uh, for people who don't want to spray chemicals. And so basically you get three plots here. One of them is covered completely with clover and Two of the plots do not get nitrogen, and one of the plot gets herbicides, and the other plot gets nitrogen. And so right here, you've got a plot full of clover, no nitrogen, no herbicide. This is no nitrogen and herbicide, and this is nitrogen. And when you read scientific journal articles about the relationship that turf grass a plant, or sorry, that, that clover has with rhizobium, the bacteria in the soil to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. If you provide nitrogen to that system, the clover becomes less competitive than the turf grass does because the clover doesn't have any need to form a relationship with the bacteria because it's already getting nitrogen that you apply to the soil. And so then the turf grass happens to be more dense and it happens to outcompete the clover in that setting. So it's all about turf grass ecology. And so, again, we've got to think about what can we do in the future. So this is a setting, this is in San Francisco. Um, this is actually a great golf course. It's Alistair McKenzie designed San Francisco, a very, um, it's called Sharps Park. It's a very uh, yuppie neighborhood, very, very beautiful area, very expensive area. They also happen to have a salamander on their marsh in the middle of the golf course that it makes it 100% pesticide free. You can spray nothing on that site and the community is very involved. And so I went to visit that golf course and it was completely, greens were completely covered in brass button. And this golf course means a lot to the community. Actually, um, the architect Doak was on the golf course the week before I arrived at this small golf course and was painting the outside of the greens because the community wants this golf course to succeed, but they can't spray any herbicides at all. And it was just covered in brass button. And the only thing I can think about is, well, you have to study that weed. You have to learn about its ecology in a non-herbicide setting and then try to manage it accordingly. And so, you know, I don't have the answer to that. It could be resod the green 
could also be maybe you look at verticutting, look at things like that in that particular setting. I don't know anything about brass button. One thing we do deal with as golfers is we make disruptions in our density ourselves using divots. And so we use things, we do a lot of divot research at Oregon State. Here's Alec Kowalewski, the PI at the university. He's actually going to make a divot with this divot machine. And so it provides a way for us to have consistent, <laughs> consistent divoting. It's a fun video. Um, and so you can also use a machine like that just to make consistent depth. So this is a study that was done by a Master's of Science student at Oregon State, Ty Patton, and he was looking at ways of filling divots using some divot mixes to try to hold on to some moisture. And what he basically found, looking across the x-axis, is if you had sand by itself, sand and seed, or sand seed in one of these other products, it, the, the thing he actually found in his trial was he had two different irrigation regimes. The gray bar is when he applied half the water in the morning and half in the afternoon as a syringe, and the other is just all the water in the morning in the green bar. And you can see on the gray bar, there's a strong suggestion that the uh, afternoon syringe was important for turf grass seed germination. This is just basic turf science. You put seed out in your, in your divot mix, even though you may have a product, this wonder soil seems to be effective, could be uh, useful perhaps, uh, but in general, in general, we just have to get back to the science and try to fill the divot as quickly as possible. Perennial ryegrass can germinate in three days. It's important to remember that. Perennial ryegrass is a wonderful grass for germination in three days. So, let's see, next slide. And we've also done some similar work at Oregon State. This is more towards the late in the end of the summer, um, but we found that compost filled like turf mend products tend to fill the divots a little bit faster. So I mentioned earlier that renovation is always an option. Perennial ryegrass germinates in three days. Um, you can use things like phrase mowers, and phrase mowers are effective at completely cleaning your site quickly. They also can remove some of the soil seed bank. You've got seed from weeds that are in the top inch of soil by, by a vast number. Every time you spray glyphosate in or on our site in Oregon, if you put water down, you get weeds. It's just there. So one thing you can do is you can renovate the area, try to get some density. There's a lot of questions about what to do with all this debris um, because you've got weed seeds in it, but you know, for as a renovation technique, it can be something positive. This is a closer up of that machine for steaming. So this is basically a diesel powered broiler on the back of a tractor that just produces high hot water and then you can go out with a hand machine or you can actually get a machine like a disc that spins in front of a tractor and you can drive across the site. Um, this is very similar. This is another study we do. Again, Oregon's very much uh, concerned about spraying chemicals as well. There's a lot of interest in the community to have a uh, herbicide-free environment. So I did an alternative herbicide trial as a uh, kind of looking at alternatives to glyphosate. And we used uh, these products here on the left, so we don't need to go through the whole list, but it's very similar to what John Kaminsky just presented. It's like clove oils, caprylic acids, things like that. The key is, um, actually, Maggie Ryder, who's at the conference, did a very similar thing at UC Riverside, and the way she presented the data I thought was great, so I, was, I just presented it that way here too. So basically what I did is I set up all these treatments, um, and, and um, two weeks later, I sprayed glyphosate, and I was taking pictures periodically. So what's in this red bar is actually the photo of the plot right before I sprayed it again. And so I, only, I sprayed everything except for glyphosate every two weeks. And if you just look briefly down the columns, there's green tissue in all of these, except for the glyphosate as it moves across. That's not a surprise. This is not a slide to tell you that glyphosate is great. We know it works well. What it's supposed to tell you as a stakeholder is which of these products may be worthwhile to consider. And so the only product that I found that was kind of nuking it more or less was this acetic acid, which John gave you the price of. I think that that price could go down because right now it's sold as a ready to use one gallon product. You're actually even paying for water um, the way it's sold in the United States. So maybe you can get a, a different a kind of uh, a price point on that. And so, you know, I don't have an option. Uh, I don't really know what the answer is, but you can imagine using something like these smart sprayers to maybe bump up the amount of product per nozzle. And once these get on the market, especially for turf, for example, instead of having your boom spacing of maybe 
Um, what, what are they now? About 25 centimeters or something apart. Maybe you could have three booms where there's a nozzle every seven centimeters. And you can have you know, all kinds of cameras. This is maybe something that we'll see in the future. And then you'll just be pinpointing cone sprays where these are. And then immediately, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to go out and you're going to have to put seed in that void or the weeds are going to come back. And so that's something. Um, Dr. Daniel Hahn, um, this is not new information. Dr. Daniel Hahn, one of his chapters was about detecting broadleaf weeds with image analysis. This is, this, this is common. People are working on this right now. So he was able to, to pull apart those um, different components of the, of the stand, and you can imagine setting up your sprayer accordingly. Again, you could maybe use these sprayers to apply um, these alternative products, but at the same time, if you can get like a a, 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 an exemption from your herbicide application, if you can show your community that's, that's regulating these products, that maybe you could spray 20% of the herbicides per acre that you're currently spraying using this, you could also time your applications accordingly. So we find, and this should not be new to anyone, if you spray a perennial weed in the fall, you are going to kill that weed with a systemic herbicide more than if you spray it in the spring because the phloem or the way the sugars are moving in the plant or the sugars are going down in the fall to prepare for the winter as opposed to the spring where you've got your smeristem which is pushing the flower up is pushing those sugars up and so what actually happens is you may defoliate the plant but you don't actually kill the weed so there there are um, logical options to try to move forward um, with that and so this is a close-up of the electric weeder. Martin, I don't know how much time I have, but I only got a few more slides. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually a pretty cool technique. This is new. So this is not selective. This is non-selective. And it's basically these little blades here will drive across the surface of any vegetation, and it grounds the electricity. And it basically uses the water inside of the cell to boil the plant. So that's just a lot less equipment to pull across the site than it is to these big broilers with diesel and have to fill the tank again with water. You actually are just using the liquid inside of the plant itself to burn the plant. And so that can be, and that's something that we're seeing in agriculture quite a bit, in row crops. People are using that in blueberries and things like that in Oregon, and I think they're using it to a great extent in New York State right now. Um, this is kind of funny. Onion World, July, August 2022. You're right on the cusp of technology here. You've got this, uh, this laser weeder. There's a nice article on that. This is actually available online. Um, but these are, these are really cool technologies. That, and you can watch videos of these things just slowly pinpoint spray these weeds inside of these desirable crops. My last slide is if you are doing any kind of these alternative techniques or you're just deciding to renovate, Get back to turf grass science. When you see a void, put down seed. Perennial ryegrass germinates in three days. This is a no-brainer. Uh, fairways can be maintained with perennial ryegrass, perennial grass to gray grass. I, I understand that there can be complexities in managing fine fescues and all those things. And there's a lot more to this picture. We can talk about allelopathy and things like that, but I don't personally have that expertise. I hope that was useful to some of you, and uh, thank you for having me.